Hello, everyone, and thank you for t t attending today's webinar, Unlocking New Services Through Transformation to Distributed Service Provider Cloud, presented today by Juniper. I'm Sean Buckley, and I'll be moderating this webinar. Our speakers today are Chris Bacciallo, Director of Service Provider Cloud Solutions at Juniper Networks. Joining him is Ron Parker, Chief Architect at Affirm Networks. You could read their full bios on the right side of your window. Before we begin, begin, just a few technical notes. If you'd like to download the slide deck, please click the resources list button at the bottom of your screen. The webcast is being streamed through your computer, so there's no dial-in number. For the best audio quality, please make sure your volume is up. You can find additional answers to some of your common technical issues located in the help button at the bottom. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on demand within 24 hours after the event. We'll follow up the presentations with the Q&A session. Please submit your questions using the Q&A button on the left side of your screen. All right, with that aside, now let's begin. Chris, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Sean, and um, thank you uh, for those that are online uh, for the seminar. appreciate your, uh, your time today. Uh, so Rod and I are, are going to be talking about um, uh, the transformation to distributed service provider cloud. Um, so what we're really talking about today is helping service providers solve a business problem uh, using technology. So the current business problem that uh, most mobile providers are facing today is they're faced with um, rising uh, data, mobile data um, levels that are rising at about 45 to 55 percent uh, cumulatively every year. Um, and at the same time, unfortunately, the revenues are flattening. So there's huge margin pressures. So service providers are looking at new technologies, new architectures to deploy mobile services more efficiently, more rapidly, more cost effectively. So with that understanding, they're looking at technologies like virtualization. So they're heavily leveraging virtualization and taking advantages of cloud principles for, for management of, um, of network functions. Um, once the, uh, the functions are virtualized, they can also take advantage of decomposition and distribution, so the distribution of functions uh, when and where they need them in their network to allow them, again, to deliver services more efficiently, effectively, uh, more flexibly. Uh, and also combining uh, analytics with artificial intelligence um, and combining those to create automation through uh, scripting and orchestration in the network, um, that, that is a, a step towards autonomous networking, or as Juniper likes to call it, self-driving networks. So networks that self-heal, self-optimize, um, and self-scale, self-provision, et cetera. So we'll look at uh, service provider cloud transformation. There's really three steps. As I mentioned, the first step is virtualization. So taking physical functions, uh, virtualizing them, and running them on generic compute in a virtual machine or container environment. Uh, the second step is decomposition. So taking network functions, breaking them up into their subparts, which now allows you to independently scale those subcomponents of a function or distribute where you need them. And the third step is distribution. Now that you've decomposed a function into its basic parts, we can now distribute those basic parts anywhere we need in the network. For example, we can separate user plane and control plane of a network function and distribute the user plane separately from the control plane, which could, be, which could remain centralized. So in the network on the left of the slide, uh, we show a typical centralized mobile service delivery, which has many issues today. Uh, there's bottlenecks in the, uh, in the core in the centralized solution, bottlenecks in terms of user plane, control plane, also in logical interface scale. Uh, there's latency issues because all of the applications are centralized. Um, there is uh, issues with suboptimal routing. Often you have to hairpin traffic through a centralized core. And there is availability issues. There's uh, single points of failure in the centralized core solution. 
So if we move to the diagram on the right side of the uh, slide, uh, we're looking at a distributed environment for service provider cloud, and we've alleviated uh, most of those issues. So now we, um, we've distributed control plane and user plane functions through the network. So we eliminate the bottlenecks. We eliminate the single point of failure. We drastically reduce latency for applications uh, running in the network. So there's many functions that, that would benefit from distribution in a service provider network. Uh, there's a bunch of low latency IoT services, critical IoT functions, industrial IoT, uh, like factory of the future where um, factories will be tied into the end-to-end -end, uh, value chain of providing uh, production on demand with you know, limited to no overhead in, and inventory. Um, there's medical applications as hospitals and healthcare. Uh, trend towards distribution of services, supporting EMS with adi additional diagnosis and treatment capabilities. Um, there's automotive applications we'll talk a bit about, like augmented reality, which um, greatly benefit from low latency applications. Um, there's an opportunity to extend the battery life of battery-powered IoT sensors. Uh, like asset tracking devices, security devices, et cetera. We'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, and also there's, um, there's capabilities to leverage di distributed user plane for um, larger scale, and that, that would be ideal for fixed wireless access. And Ron will talk a bit about that uh, later on in the presentation as well. So there's multiple different uh, edge compute initiatives um, in the industry today. So 3GPP, we're going to talk about um, 3GPP initiatives. One of the initiatives there is it's called CUPS, Control User Plane Separation. Um, as, as the acronym um, suggests, it allows you to separate a, um, an Evolve Packet Core into user plane and, and uh, control plane. Uh, CORD stands for Central Office, re-architected as a data center. Um, very similar to what we've been talking about, leverages SDN, NFE, and cloud principles to deliver scalable services more efficiently and effectively. Um, Etsy, uh, Etsy, of course, is the author of the, um, the NFE re reference architecture. Uh, they've also built a, an architecture called MEC, uh, which stands for Multi-Access Edge Computing. Uh, Carnegie Mellon University, through research, uh, developed the concept of cloudlets, um, which has now e evolved into open edge computing. Uh, there's open fog, which is uh, meant to be complementary to MEC, multi-access edge computing, with a focus on interfaces and applications. And even the over-the-top providers, so we have Amazon with their recently launched uh, AWS Greengrass services uh, designed to allow their customers to support latency-sensitive IoT applications on-premise or in the edge of a service provider net hosted network. And uh, Azure, uh, similar uh, service offering with their IoT Edge uh, solution. And uh, even Facebook with their telecom infra project or TIP has, um, is working on software and har hardware open source solutions that encompass access, edge, and core. So a bit of a deeper dive on the Etsy MEC solution. When MEC first came out, it was actually, the acronym stood for Mobile Edge Computing. But as time went on, um, Etsy decided to change the acronym to be uh, Multi-Access Edge Computing. But the initial use case was built on mobility, and that's shown in the slide here. So in the upper right, uh, we show a, a MEC platform uh, in a mobility environment. And in a mobility environment, MEC is designed to sit on an interface between the eNodeBs or base stations and the Evolve Packet Core. And that interface is called an S1 interface. And on that S1 interface, you may have to deal with uh, IPsec encryption. So there's a, a VSEC gateway in the MEC platform. 
um, and you have to deal with a, um, an encapsulation protocol called GTP, or Generic Tunneling Protocol, and that is also handled by the MAP platform. And then on the MAP platform, um, you can run third-party applications. So uh, MEC provides a, uh, an architecture for the uh, distribution of functions into a uh, edge network. And as you can see there, the, um, we've done some business case analysis. The most logical lo location in terms of cost efficiencies and you know, performance advantages, latency reduction, is at the aggregation or um, pre-aggregation layer of a mobile provider network. Ron, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, so as Chris is talking about distributed service provider cloud networks, um, we see uh, Evolve Packet Core and mobility um, come as uh, very key aspects of the distributed cloud network. So now we have both uh, fixed, line, fixed line and uh, mobility uh, and moving toward fixed wireless options as well. So we can't really evaluate the distributed cloud network without also incorporating the Evolve Packet Core and um, the Evolve, Evolve Packet Core as it grows toward 5G as well. So uh, in this slide, we're, we're really showing that there's this very exciting uh, confluence of concepts and ideas all being worked together. And how do you put them together so that they uh, you know, give you a useful solution? They're not just um, pieces of technology for the sake of technology. So as we go around the circle, um, and I'll start at the cups uh, on the right side, since this is um, one of the topics we're talking about. So in the Evolved Packet Core, as we get to the ability to deploy uh, user plane and control plane um, as logically separate entities, uh, now we can put them in physically separate places as well, and we can have whatever fan out characteristics we want. Um, you know, single uh, control plane controlling many user plane instances in many locations, or even a many-to-many -many case where um, you've got a round robin of uh, a small number of control plane locations all controlling the same set of distributed user plane locations. So CUPS is a very, very key part of this, but as we come around the circle, edge computing plays into this as well because now that I have the ability to logically and physically separate my um, packet core user plane control plane, uh, the edge computing locations are an ideal place uh, for user plane uh, in many scenarios, and we'll come to this in terms of use cases later. Um, the next one up is orchestration and automation. Um, the more different kinds of things you have, the more instances you have, the more locations you have, the more services you overlay, the more important it is to um, orchestrate in an automated fashion and reduce the amount of human intervention required to uh, create new services, locations, uh, slices we'll get to, um, as well as to life cycle manage them. So it's not just the creation, but the ongoing life cycle management. So this becomes ever more important in our new network uh, topologies. Uh, Cloud Native is a set of design patterns where um, we can now realize software solutions um, in a more um, enterprise cloud uh, like manner, um, which includes microservices based uh, designs. Um, orchestratable, containerized, uh, generally stateless, so we separate the, uh, the state that the application needs uh, into a distinct uh, storage layer, giving us all kinds of advantages around um, resiliency and hyperscale, as well as simplifying the way we build software. And any, any time that we can, uh, the vendor can uh, create and deliver software uh, more quickly, more inexpensively, that's going to have um, benefit to the end customer as well and to the, the network architecture. Um, IoT is something that's coming in, in, on this theme of confluence of, of events and developments in the industry, um, massive IoT, critical IoT, um, all of these pieces uh, together help serve that emerging marketplace as well. Uh, and then we come around to network slicing. Um, network slicing is the ability to uh, separate um, uh, service delivery silos, give them their own resources, their own policies, their own configurations. And um, as we move into distributed network architecture, this becomes ever more 
uh, necessary and important. Um, and we also get some new weapons here, like uh, the cups and the, the control plane and the user plane. Um, you know, you can come to different slicing scenarios on perhaps user planes are uh, isolated per um, per enterprise, per MVNO, per um, service, uh, but maybe control planes are shared. And we'll see see some of this as we go forward in the presentation. So just zooming in on uh, cups a little bit more. Uh, since we've been talking about it quite a bit. Um, in the CUPS architecture, um, you're able to um, separate logical uh, instances of your control plane user plane, and generally it's because you'd like to have the flexibility to physically separate them as well. Um, and that gives you a lot of advantage, but the obvious question might arise, why do I bother? Why don't I just take the traditional type of evolved packet core gateway and have lots of them out at the edge. What's the disadvantage to that? Well, one disadvantage is that in packet core, there are a lot of fairly heavy um, control plane interfaces to be maintained from each gateway. So this includes um, online and offline charging, policy control, uh, authentication authorization, um, all of these things uh, really are relatively heavy. And so if you're managing some quantity of gateways in the tens and you're managing all the relationships back to these centralized uh, charging servers, authentication servers, policy servers, if that number moves from the tens to the hundreds, um, that's, that's a more operationally complex and expensive network, and those centralized servers may not be capable of dealing with so many disparate clients. So CUPS can be seen as a grand compromise where we'll keep the, the quantity of control plane instances more or less as it was. We'll probably keep the physical locations of them more or less as they were, um, and thereby not um, overburden my back-end um, charging authentication policy and related servers um, and kind of shield from them uh, the number of user plane locations that we have. And the left side of this slide is, is describing this where um, the control plane um, complexity isn't increased, um, but the flexibility to have more user plane locations is, is the enhancement. Uh, in the right subpanel of this slide, um, it's a more network view of the world where the CUPS C-plane controller will tend to be at a more centralized location. Uh, and there's um, obviously a layer uh, three distribution network um, to get from that central location to all those distributed locations. There's also a layer three for the, the heavier user plane traffic that presumably uh, no longer needs to neck through the centralized location. Uh, so we see uh, CUPS U-plane instances at more distributed sites, but we also see it at the central sites. That's an important characteristic in CUPS, that it's logically separated. You're allowed to physically separate, but you don't have to physically separate. And we see that um, locations that are uh, centralized will still uh, be necessary in some cases, like in massive IoT, where the amount of bandwidth is really not that great a concern. It's more of a uh, control plane heavy uh, environment than a user plane heavy environment. Um, it, it's probably advantageous to keep that user plane for massive IoT in a more centralized location where fixed wireless uh, and some of the other specialized use cases that want um, more edge services and or have very high bandwidth concentrations at the edge um, demand more of a distributed approach. So CUPS gives us all of that flexibility. I'm going to turn it back to Chris to now work CUPS into the higher level. Oops, sorry, there was one too many. Um, let me go back one. Uh, get to the right <laughs> slide here. Yes, yeah, so Chris, if you can take uh, the discussion of how now CUPS fits into the overall distributed service provider cloud. Uh, thanks, Ron. So uh, as, as Ron mentioned, uh, CUPS allows distribution of the user plane. So there's two different deployment options. Um, so one uh, based on a physical user plane and another based on a virtual user plane. So uh, virt a physical user plane can take advantage of uh, routers and switches that may um, be deployed in a service provider network 
uh, leveraging the, uh, the scaling of hardware-based forwarding and programmable ASICs. Um, and also, you know, uh, potentially leveraging a service provider's installed base, um, you know, avoiding some additional capex uh, for, for new servers for a compute-based uh, solution. Um, and the other option is a virtualized user plane, so le leveraging, you know, again, a software-based user plane um, deployed in an edge compute uh, scenario running on generic uh, compute servers uh, distributed through the network. And in this case, the, um, the Juniper solution is built on a distributed Contrail, a distributed SDN solution, which actually mirrors the, uh, the topology of, of CUPS in this scenario, where the SDN controller, so the control plane for SDN is centrally located, and the SDN controlled virtual router is distributed with the user plane. So we have a distributed virtual router and centralized controller. Um, supporting uh, a end-to-end -end cloud enabled you know virtualized user plane back to you Ron thanks Chris so um, we're going to touch on slicing now so 5g um, introduces the concept of slicing as, as an inherent part of the overall network architecture but before 5g even comes along um, slicing really is about isolation. So how can we um, achieve the desired level of isolation in a very flexible way, um, even in our existing 4G and 3G networks? So um, at Affirmed, we have a product we call the Virtual Slice Selection Function, the VSSF. And this is a good um, way for me to describe the concepts around the slicing. So within slicing, um, we have different categories of service, and we have different uh, like a uh, wireless local loop, which would be a fixed wireless kind of approach. We have MVNOs, uh, we've connected cars, we have uh, traditional mobility enterprise, uh, you know, like in uh, a FedEx type of uh, roaming terminal um, approach. Um, so we have these different categories, and within each category we have instances, like if we're supporting uh, mo mobile virtual network operators, um, so the mobile network operator might provide this service for third-party MBNOs to use their uh, radio network, uh, ostensibly that have more than one signed up. So it's not just the category, but now it's the instance. So what we'd like to achieve is in a very fine-grained manner, taking into account policy around um, who the subscriber is, what their uh, business affiliation is, maybe what their location is, what applications uh, they intend to utilize. Um, we'd like to use all of this rich policy um, in terms of selecting a slice. So this is the general concept around uh, this, this um, UE uh, for this connection uh, wants this particular slice. Uh, the UE could perhaps belong to multiple slices simultaneously, but what do we mean by a slice? So within slicing, uh, we need to determine what's common and what's um, isolated, what's dedicated. Uh, and CUPS gives us even a new granularity that we can use when we're deciding just how much um, isolation are we willing to pay for. So we can now separately select the C-plane slice and the U-plane slice. And we have some examples here. Like for wireless local loop, um, perhaps we choose that we'd like a, a C-plane that handles only the fixed wireless, um, but we'd like to separate out the U-planes uh, for the residential customers and the enterprise customers for the fixed wireless. So perhaps we perceive that it's not worthwhile changing uh, or separating the C-plane, especially since in fixed wireless there's uh, no mobility, only a very small amount of technical mobility if the UE is at um, a cell boundary. There can be handoffs due to changing radio condition, but that's a very, very small amount of mobility. Um, so perhaps it's simply not worth it for us to incur the expense of um, two seaplanes for the residential and the enterprise part of our um, wireless local loop service. Maybe we share the seaplane, go for separate U-planes. Uh, similar, uh, shown as an example in the MVNO slice, perhaps we have a common C-plane for each MVNO, 
but separate U-planes. And U-planes are really even more policy rich than C-planes. C-planes, we do engineering around needing to handle the transaction uh, rate and handle the number of sessions. Um, but there's not a lot of very specific policy around service function chaining um, and the service functions that reside, whereas all of that uh, is within the U-plane. So we have a lot of rich um, slicing abilities when we talk about slicing the U-plane. Uh, but then as a counterexample, I'm showing connected car. Um, and here, perhaps I've got multiple car manufacturers like um, Audi and um, General Motors and, um, and BMW, and perhaps in this case, um, they each would prefer their own isolated C-plane and U-plane. So CUPS gives us this additional flexibility that we can then leverage um, with appropriate service selection functions in, um, in 5G, but also in 4G and 3G. Um, so now I'm going to hand it back to Chris to pick up the next part. Thanks, Ron. Um, so the ultimate goal in our service provider cloud is to take the uh, network slicing that uh, Ron was discussing and make it uh, continuous from end to end across a service provider network. So from right from the user device all the way through the core and the service complex. Um, and to do that, uh, we, have to, we have to leverage a, um, a homogeneous policy environment, end-to-end uh, -end orchestration environment to make sure that um, you know, the policies and QAS, um, et cetera, are consistent across all components of the slice from right from RAN to core. Um, so we can do that um, in the underlay. We leverage uh, technologies uh, such as uh, Juno node slicing, uh, a Juniper uh, technology that allows you to take a physical router and break it up into uh, multiple virtual routers. Each router, each virtual router, uh, has its own control plane, user plane, management plane, and, and administrative environment. So it's treated as a, for all intents and purposes, a, a separate uh, router. And also in the overlay, using uh, Contrail SDN, for example, and its multi-tenancy capabilities, uh, it's able to create uh, layer three logical. Uh, VPNs in an overlay uh, that are secured, um, and we can use that um, to manage slicing in the overlay. And in addition to that, we have the flexibility of allowing um, inter-slicing communications if needed, if necessary, uh, through the use of uh, Contrail security policies, uh, where we can establish security policies between individual slices in the overlay. Um, and we can also uh, forward traffic to a next-gen firewall, like the virtual SRX, that could do more advanced um, security policies between slices and the network. So it's a few different options there. So we're going to talk uh, a bit about applications and uh, use cases for distributed uh, compute. So one of the first ones we wanted to talk about was uh, battery-powered sensors. So there's, a, there's been a proliferation of um, you know, IoT devices in the form of wireless sensors. So wireless sensors that are doing asset tracking, maybe they're meters, uh, maybe they're doing uh, environmental uh, monitoring, maybe they're uh, measuring traffic, monitoring traffic. Um, and these uh, sensors may not have access to uh, an energy source or cost-effective access to an energy source. Or a, um, or a renewable energy source like uh, solar power. So instead, they are equipped with batteries. And often those batteries will last you know, two, three years, uh, sometimes uh, you know, much more than that, all the way up to 10 years, depending on the application and the battery size. Um, so the problem is, is every, every several years when the, when the uh, batteries are, are um, no longer functional, um, you have to replace the batteries. And these batteries, of course, are you know, physically distributed throughout a, a IoT provider's um, domain. And uh, so you have the cost of replacing the batteries themselves, but also much more than that, you have the cost of rolling a truck um, for each and every IoT sensor site. So if you have maybe a dozen sensors um, in a location, no big deal, but 
if an IoT provider has tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of sensors, the, um, the cost, the overhead cost of having to replace the batteries every several years is extremely um, prohibitive. So there's been a lot of research into battery life extension. And one of the areas that was looked at uh, by a researcher uh, by the name of Dr. Victor Bell from uh, Microsoft, he's also the author of Cloudlets, uh, by the way, but he looked at if we were to distribute IoT applications like uh, wireless sensor applications out closer to the sensors, distributed to the edge of the network, um, and, and therefore reduce the latency, we can, we can reduce the transaction time. So when a, when a IoT device is transmitting, it's in an active state consuming much more power than when it's not transmitting, it's in an idle state. So if we can reduce the transaction time, we can reduce the amount of time that the LT device spends in active transmit mode, and hence we can reduce energy consumption. So in his study, he looked at a modest 30 millisecond reduction in transaction uh, latency, and the, the graph on the bottom right shows up to 75% improvement in battery life. So it definitely, there's there's some real serious um, advantages that prove themselves out in a in a business case really easily for uh, deploying IoT sensor applications in a distributed fashion. Another example, uh, and we're seeing live pox of this uh, in the global market today. Actually, um, that's leveraging. Uh, edge compute for augmented reality applications in the automotive sector. So imagine taking advantage of heads-up displays on on cars, which are becoming you know, increasingly pervasive in the industry, but now overlaying on the heads-up display um, information that could help with safety, navigational aids, maybe tourist information, uh, etc. So in the safety space, imagine there's a car in front of you that slams on their brakes, and the sensors in the vehicle automatically sense that, and they highlight the vehicle. Maybe they circle the vehicle in red, actually in your windshield. Or maybe there's a pedestrian on the side of the street or an animal uh, it's about, about to cross the street, and you highlight that in yellow, for example. Or maybe there, you're approaching a blind intersection, and additional sensors around that blind intersection are transmitting information about a dangerous situation in that blind intersection that's automatically displayed on your windshield uh, as an overlay through augmented reality. So there's a whole host of different um, applications that can be enabled through augmented reality. And to do that and have a real-time view of your surroundings, including additional sensors outside of the vehicle, you need very low latency uh, that can only be offered by distributed augmented reality applications. Ron, back to you. Thanks, Chris. So I have a few more um, use case examples that leverage our new distributed network capabilities. So one I spoke of earlier was fixed wireless deployments. So this is where to reach the residents or the, the business, uh, instead of having a wired connection that uh, is fiber to the home or coaxial to the home, you can think of it as um, radio to the home. So it's last mile, uh, so to speak, radio. Um, in North America in particular, we're seeing a lot of interest in doing this with millimeter wave um, 5G uh, radio. So the earliest 5G deployments in North America appear to be um, the new 5G radio um, in the uh, 28 uh, gigahertz and above uh, spectrum um, as a uh, means to cover the last mile. Um, but before the 5G next-gen core is ready from 3GPP, we'll reuse EPC technology. Um, so this is what's known as um, 5G non-standalone. It means to use uh, the new technology radio, but stay with the previous technology uh, core network. But previous here does include the CUPS capability. So it's EPC with the CUPS capability, and fixed wireless is a, an ideal 
um, application for deploying the user plane physically separate from the C plane and deploying it closer to the edge uh, because you have higher bandwidth concentrations to the edge and there is no mobility. So um, it's very easy to choose the right edge anchor um, for the particular residence or business and that anchor doesn't change as the, uh, because the homes and the businesses don't move around. Uh, so this is really an ideal application for um, for CUPS in our new distributed uh, service provider networks. Um, second use case is uh, video analytics. Um, the majority of download traffic in the Internet is uh, video, I think upwards of 70 percent. Uh, and we're starting to see much heavier use of video upload as well for um, security, public safety, uh, smart cities. And upload is typically a bigger strain on our radio networks than download, um, so we'd like to make that as efficient as possible. And there's a lot of core uh, backhaul traffic if you bring it to a central site as well. So um, this use case really leverages the uh, CUPS capabilities um, by putting your uh, video store and video analytics, your, you know, all of your video um, analysis software uh, close to the edge. So this is a good um, application for, you know, why would I want to put user planes out to the edge? Fixed wireless was one, uh, video analytics uh, is another. Um, and since you're putting this uh, video interpretation capability out at the edge, you can also do um, video optimization at the same time for both the uh, upload traffic and the download traffic if it were desired. And then an additional use case which has some similarities uh, would be emergency response. So in emergency response, we have uh, command and control that we really want to, um, that's very location specific, right? So you've got an emergency going on in one or more locations and a lot of the command and control is within a location. Um, so we'd like the ability to have um, optimized and prioritized uh, upload and download traffic uh, at this edge location. Video is one of them because one of the aspects in the emerging uh, capabilities for emergency response includes uh, video hubs. So if I've got all of my um, public safety officers uh, with video capability, they're all uploading video simultaneously and which of the streams that the others want to see, the commander might want to see, but also some of the uh, officers might want to see the video stream that another one uh, is uploading. So there's a lot of video going up and down and, and selection uh, of that. So it's a, a really another ideal use case to put this emergency response application closer to the edge uh, so we don't have to worry about the backhaul aspects and we can leverage prioritized uh, traffic handling including over the air interface. Okay, and I'm going to hand it back to Chris at this point. Thanks, Ron. Um, so I you know, wanted to summarize with a, um, you know, just a brief overview of our, uh, our joint end-to-end -end service provider cloud solution. So as you can see here, there's an end-to-end -end solution, so a complete NFEO uh, control and orchestration environment with uh, an SDN controller called Contrail Cloud, uh, AppFormix for analytics, the Affirm um, solution for orchestration is called a ASAP, for service provisioning, and of course the uh, host of best of breed orchestrators um, that we've partnered with, um, uh, OpenStack and uh, VMware and container-based like Mesos and Kubernetes. And also a portfolio of virtual network functions. So there's Juniper virtual network functions like the virtual SRX for security, the virtual MX for uh, routing, and uh, of course a um, a large portfolio of Affirm DNFs as part of the virtual EPC and as part of the uh, GI LAN as well. Uh, there's a collection of virtual functions there. And as well, the solution does support the ingestion of third-party DNFs. So we can support uh, any third-party DNFs uh, needed, uh, most typically deployed as part of the uh, GI LAN service complex. And of course, across the bottom, we show a comprehensive portfolio of physical infrastructure, so the underlying infrastructure. There's IP optical, uh, so the routing, switching, security, uh, et cetera, of available in our joint solution.
So the Juniper um, Contrail cloud solution is essentially the brains of the of the service provider cloud solution. So it provides the um, the orchestration, the seamless orchestration of network, compute, and storage. So there's various different options in the Contrail solution. One is Contrail networking. So you can take Contrail networking and couple that with a best-of-breed orchestration solution from, again, a variety of best-of-breed orchestration vendors like uh, Red Hat, uh, Canonical, Mirantis, Mesos, Kubernetes, VMware, et cetera. Uh, and then have a seamless and then orchestrated uh, network compute and storage environment. Um, built into Contrail networking is Contrail security. I mentioned that earlier in the slicing slide. Gives you the ability to manage uh, security policies in the SDN controlled overlay. Um, then there's Contrail Cloud. Contrail Cloud is essentially a bundled version of Contrail. So it's Contrail networking plus uh, OpenStack. Uh, in this case, um, we have Op Red Hat as well as uh, Canonical OpenStack available as part of Contrail Cloud. And then ultimately is uh, Contrail Cloud reference architecture. So leveraging best practices that, that uh, we've learned from real life deployments and POCs, proof of concepts, uh, we've documented our learnings in a Contrail Cloud reference architecture to help service providers deploy a Contrail solution in their own environment. Um, a key towards um, self-driving networks or fully autonomous networks is our real-time closed-loop analytics solution. So our analytics solution is able to um, pull information from the NFVI, so the NFV infrastructure, in the form of Intel uh, RDT, uh, Resource Director Technology. So there's stats uh, provided uh, from Intel processors like Xeons um, that give information on resource consumption. That would be, could be memory, could be caching, could be CPU cycles for each individual virtual machine or container. Okay? We take that information and we couple it with probe information from a firm's uh, virtual EPC. Uh, a firm has a virtual probe embedded in every function in the virtual EPC, so you don't need an external probe function. Uh, with the Affirm solution. So we couple that data, that analytics, into our engine. We analyze it in real time, and we make real time decisions to either optimize or scale or self heal uh, the network. This is our ultimate goal for a self, self driving network. And of course, security, very important to a mobile core. Uh, three key use cases in mobile core for security. Um, there is, of course, the GI firewall, which uh, protects the Evolve Packet Core from the Internet. Um, there is a VSEC gateway, which runs IPSEC, and that is between the eNodeBs, or the base stations, and the Evolve Packet Core. And there's also a firewall on the roaming interface, so that could be roaming partners for a specific mobile provider. That's also protected through a firewall. So uh, all three of these use cases are supported, supported in our joint solution with the uh, Juniper uh, Virtual SRX. And there's integrated load balancing and service chaining as part of the end-to-end -end solution. And as well, the, the VSRX is capable of supporting next-gen firewall applications as well, not just basic firewall. So intrusion detection prevention, unified threat management, uh, content and application security and recognition as well are supported. And just to summarize, so the end-to-end -end solution, Juniper and a form, uh, firm, service provider cloud uh, with virtual EPC, supports native layer three uh, overlays with service chaining, integrated load balancing. Um, there's integrated security as we discussed layer four policies built into the SDN virtual routers, and as well the ability to offload uh, security traffic to a higher layer uh, security functions like next-gen firewall functions provided by the virtual SRX. Uh, there's performance and scaling advantages through the use of CPDK and also uh, smart NIC technology where we can embed the virtual router in the NIC itself 
thereby removing all of the overhead requirements from the compute server and uh, offloading it to, uh, to a, a local NIC. Um, and we discussed the virtual probe and the closed loop analytics. Um, also, high availability and in service software upgrades are supported. And uh, end to end uh, orchestration, which is absolutely key. Orchestration and automation are key to creating a self driving service provider cloud solution. And uh, that's, uh, that's it, Sean. Is there um, any questions that we can uh, yeah, answer? Sure. I'll, I'll, throw, <clears throat> I'll uh, take a look right now. Uh, let's, let's start with a few here that, that came in. Um, let's see. Do you see MEC and CUPS as competitive or complementary? I think both of you could probably comment on that. Both of you gave a nice presentation on, on the use of these, these, tech, these approaches. So, yeah, try that. Um, yeah, so I'll take the first shot at that one. Um, I think they're very complementary. Um, I think that um, it, it's perhaps originally perceived that it's one or the other, but I don't, I don't think it has to be that way because uh, the, the edge computing uh, architecture really gives you an environment where you can deploy um, services uh, usefully, and one of those services is, is the uplane part of CUPS. So I think deploying the uplane uh, portion of, of the CUPS architecture in the MEC environment um, makes perfect sense to me. And I think the only place where uh, we end up having to do a little horse trading is exactly uh, which element does the, uh, the traffic steering. Uh, but the rest of the environment is really the same around the security gateway, uh, the service function chaining, um, all of that uh, useful capability um, is there, including uh, RAN awareness, uh, identity resolution, some of those other services that MEC brings. So I, I see them as very, very complementary. Great. Okay. Uh, let's see. Some other things that you mentioned were sort of interesting, too. Uh, you mentioned network slicing. I mean, are we, where are we at with that? I mean, you see more of the mobile operators engage in that trend. I mean, I know we see lots of MVNOs. I mean, even Walmart is <laughs> MVNO now in the mobile space, uh, offering lower cost uh, phone options. But but that's just that's just one odd, one example. But yeah, maybe we could talk, could address that that trend. Thank you. Yeah, so Chris, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll take a shot at that one too. Yeah, and then yeah, we, sure. Uh, yeah. Add some comments. Um, I think the precursor to slicing is virtualization, right? It's the Slicing is around isolation, isolation of uh, resources, as well as isolation of policy and configuration. And so before virtualization, if you wanted to have a logically separate gateway, you needed a physically separate gateway. And the physically separate gateway was generally at least a whole chassis that uh, typically would consume half a rack. Um, so the, the, it was cost prohibitive in most cases to really uh, utilize the slicing concept. So virtualization now gives you a much lower cost of entry to instantiate the n plus one instance of the thing, of the gateway controller, the gateway user. Um, so now that we have virtualization um, and we're starting to embrace some of these uh, policy-driven concepts around slicing, uh, we are starting to see an uptake. So um, not everyone has yet converted to virtualized networks, so uh, that's the precursor. But yes, we are starting to see an uptake of uh, slicing. And there's, you know, there's, yeah, yeah, I would add, uh, Ron, that there's, um, you know, there's varying degrees of, of slicing, right? Um, you know, everything from just simple logical overlays all the way up to full hardware separation. And of course, you know, every service provider has to understand the trade-offs of the different levels of slicing and the costs, of course. As you, know, as you increase the physical separation in slices, you incur more costs because you're duplicating um, hardware. But you know, there's, there's, there's been you know, simple logical overlays that have been offered in you know, packet cores for many years now. Uh, like simply you know, uh, giving uh, an enterprise or an MBO their own APN and mapping that APN to a VPN in the EPC is a, you know, it's a crude form um, of slicing. It, of course, doesn't provide end-to-end -end policies and QOS and all the other new stuff that uh, we're trying to focus on now with, a, you know, with 5G compatible network slicing. So it's really an evolutionary, um, you know, an evolutionary path as, as far as I see it. Right, right. 
Um, okay. In, another another one that I've uh, been kind of looking at as I as I research more of this <laughs> emerging segment of virtualization overall. I mean, uh, and I hear Juniper mentioned this, and the firm mentioned this, and a lot of SD WAD mentioned vendors mentioned this this concept of multi tenancy. I mean, how important is that feature to service provider customers and what they're trying to do? Um, uh, you know, uh, you guys both kind of laid out some really interesting sort of concepts here, you know, for different kinds of applications. But, you know, how important is that concept? Yeah. Uh, maybe, Chris, uh, you yeah, want to yeah, start with that one? Yeah, sure, sure, Ron. Um, so, you know, in, in the context of service provider cloud, multi-tenancy is extremely important. Um, you know, going back to the root, you know, the business problem they're trying to solve, right, which is uh, controlling operating expenses through leveraging cloud technologies, they can't afford to replicate, um, you know, the administrative domains through the network. Their solution needs to be, um, you know, it needs to be able to support all of their customer requirements. And a lot of service providers are deploying you know, uh, multi-tenancy already in the context of uh, large enterprise, right? So, uh, you know, a tenant per large enterprise. And in the mobile context, now moving on to MDNOs and uh, other slices, you know, high-priority slices, public safety, et cetera. Um, so it's extremely critical that their infrastructure support um, multi-tenancy to avoid duplication of, uh, of infrastructure again, you know, to, to uh, solve the business problem of controlling uh, operating costs and uh, capital costs. Yeah, I might add that um, we're, we're seeing slicing happening first at a more coarse granularity with an eye toward uh, the fine grain. So some of the initial slices we're seeing are more on the category of the service being delivered uh, with an eye toward then splitting it per actual enterprise um, consuming that. So, for example, uh, we might today see an IoT slice, a fixed wireless slice, and a consumer slice, uh, but then later we might see um, uh, sub-slices within there that have the per-enterprise or per-class of service uh, dimension. Great. Uh, well, we still have some more time to submit questions, so, you know, um, so if anyone in the audience wants to submit more questions, uh, you know, please please feel free to do so. But in the meantime, I'll just uh, I'll keep going with what's what's here. Um, another question is, which of the many edge compute initiatives uh, should we pay attention to? I mean, there's certainly a number of them. I mean, it seems like there's one new every week, and uh, that that seems to be popping up. But but you know, maybe if both of you want to tackle that, that'd be great. Yeah, for sure, Sean. Um, the um so the one slide I had uh, in the presentation listed a bunch of the uh, edge computer initiatives that um, that I'm aware of today. Um, I, I, I purposely left the, the top row as the as the ones I believe are the um, you know, the most um, the most interesting to watch. So the top row was um, 3GPP, of course. Um, you know, of course, the, you know the the standards body driving uh, mobility standards evolution. And there was Etsy, of course, and Etsy, of course, is driving the NFE reference architecture, and now MEC as well. And uh, Cord, uh, Cord is another one that I'm seeing uh, gaining momentum in the industry, uh, Cord adoption. Um, so th those are the top three I would focus on. Um, but, you know, it, it take the others, um, you know, in, into consideration as well, but uh, depending on your, on your purposes and your applications. Great. Uh, yeah, Cord seems to be a big one that we, we're seeing more uh, service providers kind of paying attention to. Um, I guess I've got time for maybe like one more question here. But uh, I mean, it's still kind of a new, I mean, as much as we're all kind of on board with the virtualization topic, and I think that's where service providers want to go, like AT&T and Verizon, CenturyLink, and as well as the European and Asian providers. But, uh, but, but for both of you, what are the challenges in conveying a software Software-centric, you know, vision and virtualization vision to your customers, and you know, uh, what's the challenges for being a vendor <laughs> that have, you know, is operated in a hardware environment for many years? And it's got kind of two questions there, but uh, yeah, we can address that. Yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll yeah, take um, a, a first shot, and okay. I think Chris will have some uh, some useful commentary on this as well. Um, 
So at Affirmed, we've been delivering uh, software-based virtualization solutions for a number of years now. We have uh, some very large major deployments around the world, so we've, we've learned a lot from that. It's been a great uh, learning opportunity. And the way we um, present virtualization technologies to our customers, it's not a static thing, right? This is growing. Um, we've got this confluence of developments happening in the industry now, which we're very, very excited about. Um, moves toward not just virtualization, but cloud native uh, approaches to virtualization, uh, distributed networks, which we've talked about um, today. Uh, CUPS is a, an important part of that, MEC. Um, closed loop orchestration is really important, uh, 5G evolution. So our, our messaging around virtualization is something that continues to grow and, and be enhanced by uh, what's happening in the industry, our own learnings from our uh, deployments, and our thinking about how to put all of these emerging technologies together into something that's cohesive and useful. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Ron. Um, yeah, so you know, from from a Juniper pers perspective, our experience is is, um, is similar. Um, you know, we see. Um, I've n I've never met a service provider that's that's stated to me we're not going to invest in virtualization. The question is always uh, when, and the biggest barrier for them is is the evolution or the transformation of their operational practices. It's not about the technology. It's about um, all of the legacy processes they have in place inside their organization that were created over many decades, many decades of you know historical, uh, you know, the technologies and different services that they've offered over the years. Um, so that's the biggest issue. And often we, for those customers, we recommend that they create a um, a parallel overlay as part of the transformation process. So they create a parallel overlay. Uh, for virtualized services uh, with the plan to roll that back into their existing OSS, BSS infrastructure as time passes and, you know, as as their degree of comfort increases over time with experience. Um, but that that's the biggest, um, you know, uh, that's the biggest issue we've seen or roadblock is just uh, coming to terms with an understanding of how to transform their internal um, operational practices and organizations, and you know, just thinking and skill sets, etc. Great, great. Certainly, a lot to a lot to think about. I guess we got time for one more question here. Um, the question is, how do I distribute network functions without adding complexity and incurring additional operating expenses? Certainly, a, a big uh, big issue there. Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah, that's that precisely yeah, you the, the point of of the CUPS architecture that um, as we add more gateways, uh, say we went from tens to hundreds of, uh, of gateway um, instances in a network, um, that really drives complexity in a big way because the interfaces back to those centralized servers um, are um, complicated and therefore expensive to operate. And sometimes those centralized servers have limitations in terms of how many distinct clients they can deal with. So um, increasing the number of gateways is, is a huge uh, barrier uh, in terms of complexity network operations. And CUPS comes along and says, well, you know, we'll take the, the most expensive part of this and we won't add instances. The centralized servers uh, to which we're running diameter and radius and, and related protocols, they, they won't really see the difference. They don't understand that, uh, that we're moving to a distributed network. Um, and now we'll just, um, the controllers, the CUPS controllers are the pivot points that do understand there are many uh, user plane instances. But even there, we have a, uh, a fairly um, straightforward protocol called PFCP, Packet Flow Control Protocol, um, which is the protocol 3GPP is standardized for how the controller uh, talks to its many uh, user plane instances. So I think um, CUPS is really precisely around that, um, that issue of minimizing the additional complexity that you've incurred by distributing uh, the EPC more broadly. I agree, Ron. And it, you know, it's very it's very important to deploy a you know an end-to-end -end cloud-enabled infrastructure, complete with you know orchestration, analytics, automation, 
uh, to support a you know a holistic end-to-end -end cloud-enabled infrastructure. I know I've talked to customers um, that have deployed you know virtual network functions in their network, but without the you know the orchestration and the SDN control and the automation component. So at the end of the day, they were they had a a rack of servers sitting next to a physical rack, doing the same thing, cost about the same. Uh, there was no operational efficiencies because they didn't fully implement um, you know, a service provider cloud solution. Great. Um, great. Well, thanks, thanks for those, those, those great responses, some great questions. Um, that, that's the final question for today. Uh, we did have a lot of great questions today and couldn't get to them all, but we will be, be getting back to everybody who submitted personally after the webinar. Um, thanks for attending the Fierce Markets webinar and submitting so many great questions. I'd also like to thank our speakers uh, for participating and Juniper for presenting today's webinar. Finally, the webinar has been recorded, so you'll be able to access the recording within 24 hours using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier. Uh, hi, again, this is Sean Buckley of Fierce Telecom, and I want to thank you again for joining, and we look forward to seeing you at future events. Thanks very much. Have a great day.